Genesis 46. The family reunion is finally happening. As far as I know, there are no issues we need to resolve. Which means it's time for the Bible to throw more genealogy at us. Why God? Why? So Israel set out with all that was his. And when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Given the number of people traveling with him, he could totally sacrifice at least half his sons and no one would notice. Beersheba, if you recall, is the place where Isaac once built an altar in Genesis 26. So maybe Jezreel thinks if he offers sacrifices, he too will get to talk to God. Good luck with that. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. Huh. It worked. I mean, kind of. If you just spent all day building an altar hoping to talk to God, you'll probably dream about it too. Saying God spoke in a vision at night is the closest the Bible will ever get to saying we're just making all this up. Even God, who said his name would be Israel, is calling him Jacob now. I still can't get over how they all respond to God that way. Here I am. <laughs> if God spoke to you right now, your response would not be the same as if you were answering a random phone call. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. Why does God have to announce himself? Who else would it be? <laughs> In Genesis 26, God said to Isaac, I am the God of your father Abraham. I love how he has to clarify that he's the same God your father worshipped, just in case there's any confusion, what with all those other gods out there. And why does God need to reassure Jacob about going to Egypt? He's already on the journey. That's like being up in the air in the middle of a cross-country flight and someone telling you, you should get on that plane. Like, that would have been more useful a few days ago. Now it's useless. I've already acted on the advice you didn't give me in time. What kind of reassurance is God giving him? Go to Egypt, because if you go, I'll ride shotgun and then you'll return to Canaan and die. But at least you'll die with your long-lost son by your side. Spoiler, Jacob will die in Egypt. So God's not surely bringing him back home. God's a liar. Unless we're counting the journeys of corpses, which I would argue does not count. If you take my dead body to New Zealand, I don't get to call that a vacation. Then Jacob left Beersheba, and Israel's sons took their father Jacob and their children and their wives in the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport him. So Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt, taking with them their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in Canaan. Jacob brought with him to Egypt his sons and grandsons and his daughters and granddaughters, all his offspring. We are at the point where we are using the names Israel and Jacob in the same sentence. This is such an unnecessary thing that could have been easily fixed. How many people is this? We need to know. And, and how long is this journey? And what do you do with the diapers? Okay, here we go. It's time for a bunch of names. We gotta get through Jizreel and all his sons. These are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his descendants, who went to Egypt. Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob. The sons of Reuben, Hanuk, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. Oh my God, I cannot take this anymore. He had four boys. Maybe he had daughters, but they don't matter. The sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohud, Jachin, Zohar, and Sheul, the son of a Canaanite woman. Gotta mention that she's a Canaanite, because these people care about their purity tests. Again, six boys, no girls, that we know of. This is so boring, isn't it? Somehow the people writing the Bible saw all those earlier genealogies and thought, let's do that again! I won't give the ages of these kids or their birth dates to make it impossible to track everything, just a long list of first names only, because I'm helpful. The sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohuth, and Merari. 
the sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan had died in the land of Canaan, the sons of Perez, Hezron, and Hamul. Ur and Onan did die. Ur died for no reason at all, and Onan died for jizzing on the floor. Ah, memories. By the way, that just said Levi had three sons. But later in the Bible, in the book of Ezra, it's going to mention another one, Mali. Though other parts of the Bible say Mali is the son of Merari. D does anyone care at this point? The sons of Issachar, Tola, Pua, Job, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, and Jaleel. These were the sons Leah bore to Jacob in Padan Aram, besides his daughter Dinah. These sons and daughters of his were 33 in all. We are at 33 descendants and we are not done yet. They should not have bought a Prius. Not enough space. The sons of Gad, Ziphian, Haggai, Shuni, Esben, Ari, Arodi, and Arilai. The sons of Asher, Jimna, Ishua, Isui, and Beriah. Their sister was Sarah. The sons of Beriah, Heber, and Malkiel. These were the children born to Jacob by Zilpah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Leah, 16 in all. That is 16 descendants via a slave who may not have wanted anything to do with Jacob. 15 boys and one girl, which is about as genetically and statistically improbable as you can get. But if we're just making everything up, let's keep going. The sons of Jacob's wife Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. In Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. The sons of Benjamin, Bela, Beker, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rausch, Mupam, Hupam, and Art. These were the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 in all. There were boys named Mupim and Hupim. This does not get the attention it deserves. The sons of Benjamin get mentioned a few different times in the Bible, and they never have the same list of names. This one has 10 names, but other times his list of sons is as low as three. Like, no one in the Bible company is really keeping track. It's possible some of those sons are really grandsons, but it's all very confusing. Don't give us complicated, confusing information when you're not even careful about how you do it. But okay, another 14 people, 12 boys, zero girls. Totally normal ratio there. The son of Dan, Hushim. That's it? That there's not another dozen kids waiting in the wings? Huh. That seems both normal and, for some reason, very disappointing. Dan's family tree is as complicated as his name. The sons of Naphtali, Jazeel, Guni, Jazer, and Shillam. These were the sons born to Jacob by Bilhah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Rachel, seven in all. Another slave, another seven descendants, all male. All those who went to Egypt with Jacob, those who were his direct descendants, not counting his son's wives, numbered 66 persons. With the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family, which went to Egypt, were 70 in all. A 70-person road trip. That sounds horrible. How do you pick which podcast you listen to? Do you know how many times you'll have to stop because someone needs to use the bathroom? In the book of Acts in the New Testament, they give the number of travelers here as 75. No explanation for the contradiction. Though when you're on a journey that long with that many people, I suppose it's possible some of them just conceive along the way. What else are they supposed to do? I read one Bible commentary that said we shouldn't worry about counting exactly 70 people because the Bible just approximates. They like to round. Which made me laugh only because young earth creationists go crazy trying to pinpoint the exact date and time God poofed the world into existence. Meanwhile, these people are like, how many people is that? Six dozen? I can't deal with that many. 
Did I count that kid twice? You know what? Just say 70. It's close. Next thing you know, the Ten Commandments was actually six. They just rounded up. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. They needed directions, as if it was possible they might get lost. With 70 people! Why didn't you get the directions before you started the trip? Israel said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die, since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. I haven't seen you for years. I thought you were gone forever. Now we're reunited. Sure, we could catch up and spend time together. Or I could just die, and that would be cool too. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household, who were living in the land of Canaan, have come to me. The men are shepherds. They tend livestock, and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, what is your occupation? You should answer, your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. Why do they have to go through a job interview after Pharaoh himself invited them to come here? What's with that tiny bit of bigotry at the end there? Tell Pharaoh you're shepherds because Egyptians hate shepherds and then you'll get to live in Goshen. Well, after all that, at least we have something to look forward to now. Jizreel is gonna die. Eventually. After a grueling road trip with 70 people, give or take a lot, I can't say I blame him. 